just going to read uh, a passage of scripture uh, from Proverbs, from Proverbs 3, where I quoted from this morning. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Right, oh, I'm hoping that this is going to work. I might have to stand back here and speak. There we go. So, I, I've called it searching for wisdom. Um, we all know this one, don't we? We all know this one. Yeah? Um, what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Anyone know this one? Yeah? Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. And wisdom is knowing that you don't put it in a fruit salad. <laughs> you know? You know, is that, is that what wisdom is? Well, oh, is that, that's going to come up. Well, I used to do a lot of marking for GCSE religious studies. So I was an examiner for GCSE religious studies for about 10 years. And it, it used to make me laugh an awful lot. Some of the things that students put down as answers to questions. And one that really stuck in my mind because I thought, actually, this, this student has got it nailed on the head and they don't even know it. All right? The question was, for one mark, one of the nice warm-up questions you get, for one mark, define the word agnostic. And the answer was, God knows. And I wish I did. <laughs> I, I almost gave them a mark. <laughs> Sometimes we're wise and we don't know it, aren't we? Sometimes we're wise and we don't know it. But... But the question is, where do we find wisdom? Where do we find wisdom? So, the first thing I thought we'd do is, what, what does it mean? What is wisdom? And before we can find it, what is it? Solomon was reputed to be the world's wisest man, according to the Bible. Uh, yeah, he accumulated massive wealth, became really famous. All right? and, and, and this happened because, uh, well, ooh, let's go, I've gone too far. Um, he, and he wrote all these books in the Bible. It's what's called the wisdom literature. Uh, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. Proverbs, when he was quite young. Ecclesiastes, when he's got a midlife crisis. If you've ever read it, you'll know why. And Job, when he's really old, when he's asking all the really difficult, long questions about life. And so they're written at different phases of his life, and they reflect that quite nicely. Um, but he wasn't quite so wise as we thought, actually. Because, well, he had, se he had 700 wives. <laughs> now, if you've got 700 wives, that also means you've got 700 mothers-in-law. <laughs> now, again, is that really wise? Is that really wise? I, mean, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure that's the point. But, but, but when Solomon was asked by God, here we go. We're always struggling with this this morning, aren't we? It doesn't want to work. There we go. Solomon saw wisdom as this. The Hebrew word, I'm not very good at Hebrew pronunciation, shochma, uh, or God's wisdom. And it was, it was almost, it was a characteristic of God that was like permeating everything in creation. It was there, all right, everywhere in creation. Everywhere was shochma, God's wisdom. It was the cause of everything, the sustainer of everything. This is what wisdom was, all right. Um, oh, well done. And in Proverbs, he describes wisdom as a tree, a, a fruitful tree, but also as a, as a wise woman. Well, I'm not saying anything, all right? <laughs> a wise woman who understands the intricacies of life, both practical and spiritual. And if you ever get a chance to read Proverbs, do read a chapter a month, a month, chapter a month, chapter a day, take your month, all right? It's 31 chapters, perfect. It's really good. It's divided into what's wisdom all about, and, and then it's got some wise sayings, and it has, has more uh, practical advice, and it's sort of beautifully set out. Um, Solomon was asked, 
Well, he suggests that learning from his Proverbs leads us to wisdom. That's where we got chapter 3 from. Follow what I'm saying and you will become wise. But where did Solomon get that wisdom from? Uh, okay. Come on. No, oh, I've missed a bit out. Come on, where's it gone? Disappear. There we go. Oh, well, we'll go with this one. Let's cut this next. I'm, I'm jumping the gun. My brain's working faster than my mouth, which is very unusual. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll look at wisdom in, in three ways. Now, I've got three pictures to give you some clues uh, about what we're doing. Anyone guess what my three points are? Seek the Lord. Yeah, that's a clue. Which one was that one then? The first one. All right, okay. Is it going to come up? I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand up here, aren't I? There we go. The wisdom of seeking God. Okay. The first one is about the wisdom of seeking God. Anyone recognise what the second one is? It's a man sitting on a branch, he's cutting off. <laughs> to be honest, I, my dad had a friend who did that. <laughs> he broke both his legs. So it wasn't very wise. So, the second one is the wisdom of living God's way and not our own way. And the third one, who's that? Jesus. The wisdom of God. We're going to think about the wisdom of God himself, Jesus. Okay? So, oh, there we go. The wisdom of seeking God. This is where I thought I was before. Um, In 1 Kings chapter 3, God offers Solomon anything. Absolutely anything. Just pick it and it's yours. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And what Solomon does is that he says this. Give your servant a discerning heart and to distinguish between right and wrong. He asks essentially for wisdom. For wisdom. And because he asks for wisdom, God says, that's a fantastic choice. Well done, son. Because you've asked for something so brilliant, you will be successful in all the things that you do. Because you put me first. You put me first. That's, that's, that's incredible. So seeking God is very important. And God gives him more because he's already sought God first. So our first point really is when we seek God first, that's wisdom. That's wisdom. Putting God first. Seeking God. Solomon writes this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. I'm having to turn around all the time because I've got my contact lens. I've got stronger contact lenses, which is perfect for here. I can't see that. So so I'm having to turn around. So I do beg your pardon. When we seek God, we become wise. When we put God first and we decide, I'm putting God first, we become wise. We start to get wisdom in our life. That's important. That's very important. We begin to understand who God is because we've started to relate to God. We begin to understand who he is. That chokma, that his wisdom is everywhere. It permeates into every element of life. And when we've made that conscious decision to put God first, we begin to see that wisdom in the world, in all sorts of places, that we just didn't... No, it was there. So we begin to understand God an awful lot better. We also learn what God requires of us. Ultimately, what is our purpose? When we begin to seek God and put God first in our life, we develop our understanding of why we're here. What is our purpose? Our purpose is to worship and honour and serve God. The Lord God. (coughs) And then what happens when we do this is that we begin to modify the way we live so that we align ourselves with God's wisdom. Isn't that incredible? That actually, when we begin to seek God and put God first, we begin to align ourselves with God and what God thinks is right. Now that's powerful, that's, that's powerful stuff, to know that our 
way of thinking is becoming in tune with God, the creator and sustainer of the universe. Wow. So, that's the wisdom of seeking God. The second point is the wisdom of living God's way. Of living God's way. Wisdom versus foolishness. This section in Proverbs is really good because you get to about chapter 4 and it goes on to about chapter 20 and there's almost this like battle going on between wisdom and foolishness. And all the sayings like compare wisdom and foolishness. It's brilliant. All right? There's lots of interesting, insightful and quite funny sayings as well that actually compare the wise choices that we make when we follow God's way and the foolishness of people who are not and the things that they get wrong. And I, I've just picked on a few just to give you some tasters of the kind of things in there because we could spend hours and hours doing this. But I haven't. Look, the wise in heart accepts commands but a chattering fool comes to ruin. I should have that in my classroom. <laughs> All right? Do as you're told. All right, but a chattering fool comes to ruin. When we don't follow the obvious things that are right, we end up ignoring it and not knowing what to do. And then we destroy ourselves. We waste our time. That, 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 that's so wise. I think I'm going to do that you know, when I get back to work. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. You know, James talks about this a lot in... Oh, that went funny. James talks about this a lot in his book, about the tongue and how powerful the tongue is. But Solomon had it wise thousands of years before that actually wise words, the way we speak, the way we deal with situations, if we're following God's way, if we're putting God first, if we are in tune with God, then our words become a fountain of life. Isn't that amazing? That we can give life with the words that we say to other people. But conversely, the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. It doesn't take much to break somebody's heart, does it? You know, a nasty word, an unkind uh, phrase that we say to people can break them. Can cause damage, can cause violence within their, the, in their mind and their very being. So powerful, isn't it? So powerful. Let's have another look at another one. Here we go. Oh, my goodness, can't read that one. The righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the unfaithful are trapped by evil desires. You know, if we're living a life that is righteous, in tune with God, delivers us. Doesn't that ring true? The New Testament message, the message of Jesus on the cross, we're delivered by the righteous one because we've chosen to follow. Incredible. I'm always on because I don't want to speak too long. Oh, another white one. Oh dear, I've got that wrong, haven't I? The righteous care for the needs of their animals, and, but the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. Do you know, it even extends to the environment, doesn't it, this wisdom? Caring for nature, God's wisdom is creation, isn't it? And we have a responsibility to care for it. And that Solomon saw that. The wise man cares for his animals. But the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. You can even, that's because motive, isn't it? Do you think motive? You know, the kindest things that wicked people do is because they need something from you. So they'll give you something nice in order to get something back. Oh, what, a, what a wise guy this man was. One more from this one. Whoever is patient has great understanding, but the one who is quick-tempered displays folly. Well, you can't get wiser than that. Patience. Well, I don't need to say much about that, do I? That speaks for itself. That speaks for itself. That's hard, though, isn't it? I'm talking now. It's hard. All right? It's hard to keep your temper sometimes. Solomon says, if we can do that, we can do that with great wisdom. We have great understanding. So the second one there, the wisdom of living God's way. We need to understand what God wants and then adapt our, our lives to what God wants. Not trying to adapt God's ways to what we need. 
Too many people in the world today think, well, okay, I'm, being, I'm okay, I'm doing good, I'm doing nice, I'm not, I'm not hurting anyone, so I'm obviously doing the right thing, I'm a kind person, but actually what they're doing is adapting God's way to fit what they're already doing. And actually we need to adapt what we have been doing to fit God's word and to live according to God's word, and that's wisdom. That's wisdom. So, when we live godly lives, a moral-based life, we become wise. All right, the psalmist in Psalm 14 says, the fool says there is no God, and decides to go their own way, and make up their own moral standards, their own ways of living, their own choices, turning their back on God. And the psalmist says, that's foolish, that's not wise. And we see this way back in the very beginning of Scripture, when Adam and Eve made the the wrong choice. They turned their back on God. They did not do what God required. They did not do. They chose to turn their back on what God wanted and to do what they wanted. Because they thought they would become wise. They were deceived by the serpent. They didn't become wise. They lost their source of wisdom. They lost God. So you can see it in our world today, can't you? The people who turn their backs on God and make up their own ways of living and doing things, they get further and further away from what God requires. And ultimately, it's harder and harder for them to do the right thing and live according to the way in which God has called them to live. So the last point... Thank goodness we're nearly at the end, you're saying. He's been speaking far too long. The wisdom of God is Jesus. This is fantastic news. That God did something without wisdom. He turned it into a human being, the person of Jesus. All the wisdom of God was put into the human person of Jesus. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians, God's wisdom is greater than ours. And it talks about God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. (gasps) Yeah. All right. Then he also then goes on to talk about, in this little passage, that we just don't get it. That we don't understand God's wisdom. We think it's stupid. The world thinks that God's wisdom is pointless. That we can do it better. And so they turn from God, like Adam and Eve turned from God and did their own thing. The world has turned away from God. And it needs to turn back to acknowledge that actually we we just don't get you, God, but we need to seek you. We need to trust you. We need to do it your way. And that Paul says that Christ is the embodiment of God's wisdom. Jesus Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If we want to be wise, and we want to know what wisdom is, we just need to look at Jesus. We need to seek Jesus out. We need to follow Jesus. We need to put our trust in Jesus. So wisdom, what is wisdom? How do we get wisdom? How do we become wise? We seek Jesus. And when we have Jesus, we're on the road to wisdom because we begin to understand God's requirements, who God is, how to live the way in which God intended us to be. Now, there's a picture of him. He never knew there was a photograph of Jesus, did he? There he is. It leads to an understanding of of the character of God. When we have that relationship with Jesus, we begin to understand God. We bring, it brings forgiveness from sin, freedom from guilt, a new life, a new beginning. It leads to eternal life. We spend all our lives thinking about this much. You know, we've got eternity to think about. And we seem to put all our effort in this much, in our life. We've got eternity to think about. We're putting our effort into the wrong place, aren't we? We should be putting it into this bit. And it shapes our lives to be wise in God's eyes. Here we go. I'm going to whisk through because it's nearly half past ten. There we go. So, whoops. We'll become who God intended us to be all along. So when we seek Jesus and we put our trust in Jesus, we begin to become who God intended us to be all along. Isn't that amazing? All right, okay. I thought it was. All right. 
Um, so, how are we going to do this in 2019? I can't leave it like that. I've got to give you a challenge. All right, how are we going to do this in 2019? Well, I just want to say that looking back at 2018 and saying, well, that wasn't very good. <laughs> Didn't do that very well. Oh, oh, yeah, look at that. That was brilliant. Let's do that again. Looking back is, uh, is unwise <coughs> because it just fills you with regret. You get stuck in the past sometimes if you keep looking back and thinking that was brilliant. Oh, that wasn't good. Either way, we get stuck. We still have regrets that we cling to. But looking forward is wise. So what are we going to do in 2019? This is what Paul says we should do. We should focus on Jesus in 2019. Brothers and sisters, excuse me for turning around, I really can't see that. Uh, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus in 2019. Let's put him at the centre. Let's make him our light because we've been thinking about light coming into the world at Christmas. Let's make Jesus our light. Better still, all right? Let's make him our lighthouse so that we can focus on him. We can see Jesus and we can not get distracted in our walk with him by other things. When we make Jesus our light. Let's pray and then Pete's going to lead us in our final song. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would be our light, that you would be our wisdom, that we would look to you and your word for all that we need. Father, forgive us when we stray and we get it wrong and we think we know best. Lord, our wisdom is your foolishness. And Lord, we pray for your wisdom in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. And we only have that when we have Jesus. So Lord, we pray that your spirit would fall upon us now, that you would infuse us with your wisdom and your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name. Amen.